So welcome all to the, this uh, seminar series. We have uh, today the pleasure to have uh, Maria and Dimova from the Applied Computational Genomics uh, team at the Zurich University of Applied Science and at CIB. So Maria studied mathematics and information technology at the Pedagogical State University in Novgorod in Russia. She then taught in this field at the uh, Better Bees College London in the UK before she received a Master of Research in Modeling Biological Complexity at the University College of London in 2000. Uh, then in 2003, uh, Maria received a PhD in Statistical Genomics from the UCL, as well as in the UK, and from uh, the following four years, she uh, held postdoctoral positions at the University of Montpellier and also back at the UCL. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, she worked as a senior scientist uh, research fellow and uh, lecturer at the University of Zurich, uh, sorry, at the ETH uh, of Zurich. And since 2014, she leads the Applied uh, Computational Genomics team at the Zurich University of Applied Science. And she also became a group leader at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in 2015. Her research interests are in applied bioinformatics and computational uh, evolutionary genomics and a group focused on theoretical and computational aspects of modeling the process of genome evolution and adaptive change. Uh, the goal of the group is to bring and combine new bioinformatics methods to real applications, ranging from biotechnology to biomedical research, ecology <coughs> and agriculture, and that in order to uh, enable a wide uh, range of scientists to analyze uh, patterns of evolution and natural selection in large genomics and omics data. So today, Maria will tell us how to disentangle tandem repeats and their evolutionary history using statistical predictions. Maria, thank you again for accepting this invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And uh, thank you for your interest uh, in this topic. So today, I will talk about um, tandem repeats in genomic sequences particularly about uh, our uh, recently developed methodology, a series of methodological developments um, that took place in our group. So um, first, um, let's talk about what the tandem repeats are and uh, why they're interested. I guess uh, many of you are already aware how complex they can be and how can they complicate the things. But essentially, these are the uh, segments of genomic sequence that occur next to each other in tandem uh, by a certain mechanism that are not so well described. Uh, these repeats can propagate, expand and shrink. Um, and of course, with the divergence, with time, they diverge, accumulating mutations in those and um, possibly affected also by recommendation events, etc. Um, what's interesting about tandem repeats that they're actually very abundant. According to our recent estimates, over 60% of human proteins actually contain tandem repeats, which is a much uh, greater amount than previously has been described. The last uh, census of protein uh, tandem repeats has been accomplished uh, in 1999 by Marcotte et al. And uh, at that time, the estimation was done with uh, uh, rather uh, simplistic methods. Uh, one type of tandem repeat prediction, uh, prediction method, uh, at that time, Swiss prot was much smaller. So, uh, already at that time, 30% or over 30% of uh, proteins were predicted to contain tandem repeats. So, now we put it, these estimates at much higher rate. Of course, uh, we all know that tandem repeats cause problems for all sorts of things, uh, starting with assembly and going to any, uh, propagating to any downstream analysis, including alignment and looking for post selection, inferring trees, and so on. Um, they also very interesting, actually, these are uh, genomic uh, sequence stages that are very interesting. Uh, in proteins, for example, they often um, 
offer enhanced binding properties. They uh, form some rigid, rigid scaffolds to help protein-protein interactions. They also have some interesting enigmatic connection with uh, intrinsic, uh, diso intrinsic disordered proteins, so that the proteins that don't fold, don't have a stable uh, folded structure. Uh, this phenomenon is actually not very well described, but many publications have <coughs> pointed this out. So there are many interesting, mysterious things about tandem repeats. And of course, they have been noticed in relation to the associations with diseases and pathogenicity. pathogenicity. So therefore, uh, some four or five years ago, we, dis we applied for a grant to study how these features, genomic features, evolve and uh, what are the functional roles of these features. So um, let's just start from some examples. One of the uh, uh, very common, well-known examples is a collagen. Uh, you can see that this is essentially a triple helix. And it, collagen, yeah, collagen repeats can be very uh, similar. They can be identical, like in this uh, sequence that you can see at the top. But they can be also very diverged. And they can be different types of collagen, uh, collagen sequences. So this one is much more diverged. But nevertheless, you can see clearly some very, very strongly fixed positions. So, and, and this is a, an important protein. It's the main component of connective tissues. It's mo most abundant protein in mammals. It's mostly found in mammals, uh, um, in animals, but also, for example, found in uh, viruses, interestingly. <coughs> um, so there are also many collagen-associated diseases, which again points towards uh, importance of studying such proteins. Um, collagen, of course, is very easy to see. Uh, in, in collagen, we, we can see the repetitive structure very easily. So if we... Um, look at other type of repeats. They can be very much divergent. We won't be able to spot them not only by eye, but not, not even with uh, good predictive algorithms. So for example, this uh, gene, pertactin, contain, contains two types of repeats. You can see in the structure, uh, the two different types of repeats are colored in different color. Of course, when you look at the structure, the rep uh, repetitive nature of this protein is quite apparent. However, on the sequence level, there is a, a very vague, uh, you cannot spot this type of repetition. None of the prediction methods are able to identify this kind of uh, repetitive structure. So it's very difficult. So the more divergence we see, the, uh, the more difficult it becomes to identify such repeats. So, and of course, uh, the identical repeats are easier to, uh, to identify, comparatively easy. The more divergence happens, the more difficult it becomes, especially when we don't know how the unit should, be, uh, should look like or how long should it be. So the complexity of detecting tandem uh, repeat units correctly, and I'm not taking correctly tandem repeat regions, is quite high. Um, so we naively thought that, uh, overlooked this problem and thought that there must have been quite a lot of work uh, that's been done, indeed, uh, in 2011 when we started working on uh, repeat, uh, about 50 or more different tandem repeat predictors have been published. Uh, and yet, they uh, predicted different things. And so this is what we found out in the beginning of our studies, that um, discrepancies that we see from different predictors are very high. So let's look at this graph. Now what we see here is a prediction. Uh, so each graph corresponds to prediction of tandem repeats by different predictors. So here, HH rep ID, this one is T-Rex, Trust, and Extreme. For example, these four. Each graph uh, is essentially a two-dimensional representation of the uh, distribution of the 
tandem repeats as characterized by the predicted tandem repeat unit, the minimal unit that's repeated here. So they can be very small and they can be very long. And also the second characteristic is how many units do we see in the protein. So that's the y-axis here. And we can see that, of course, the, in, uh, this, this is all has been done on the human protein, human protein from ensemble. Uh, we can see homo repeats, so only one amino acid repeated this column. They can be seen in many, many, many uh, repetitions. As the size of the unit increases, uh, this the long <coughs> units are not repeated as many times. But there are, of course, also very interesting exceptions. So, um, one thing without looking at uh, really fine details we can see is that uh, clearly the four graphs are different. So, the, the shape of the distribution even changes. Uh, why is that? It appears that the properties of these four different predictors are different. So, it seems that Extreme, for example, is uh, quite good at predicting repeats within this uh, space here. Short repeats, many of them. Um, whereas trust is a uh, cell sequence alignment method, uh, good at predicting long repeats. So HHREP ID seems to be a little bit similar, and there is some kind of threshold here that then all the home repeats and short repeats. Uh, get emitted, and T-Rex seems to be covering this area better than, than extreme compared to extreme. So there are differences, and these differences essentially stem from assumptions and from the methodology that each of the predictors uh, assume. Uh, we also can see that for uh, the, these four different predictors, as the divergence grows, uh, the predicted repeat, tandem repeat count also changes. So, for example, this graph now compares uh, the distributions, densities, uh, for these predictors. So, let's say that we can't see really the colors very well, but the HHREP ID is this pink distribution, I believe. And so this is um, a predictor that seems to be um, pretty good at covering more or less uh, most of the divergences. The tail is really spreading out the furthest out of all the other predictors. So it's able to predict quite divergent repeats compared to all the others. On the contrary, you can see the other uh, distribution here that's really peaked. So this tandem repeat uh, predictor corresponds to this distribution is really good at predicting similar repeats, but not good at all at predicting repeats that are divergent. So, this is the conclusion essentially from this exercise. We get different predict predictions, and maybe they are all right. There might be different levels of false positive associated with different kinds of predict uh, predictors, which we also somehow want to take into account. So what do we do? How do we reconcile these conflicting predict predictions? So what we decided to do is actually take a very clean uh, statistical approach and uh, evaluate false positives um, for each of the predictors and also compare the power of predicting on simulated data. So let's look at this uh, graph here. And uh, we, we will focus first on the top part of the graph. So these graphs correspond to the false positive rate. So this is what we see, the predictions that we see on null data, data that does not contain, that should not contain any tandem repeats. Okay? So what we are prepared to tolerate is a certain amount of false positives, so for example 5%. And we want to uh, make sure that this 5% is maximum. Right? So again, without going into many details, you can see that depends whether a predictor is working on DNA level or amino acid. And uh, again, for different types of predictors, we see the shape of the distribution different, right? The, the color changes, the dark 
that uh, color corresponds to the higher density, yellow color to lower densities. Um, it seems that some predictors like T red, for example, doesn't make any mistake. That's not necessarily a good thing, because that makes the power of the method very low. It's always a balance of uh, power and accuracy. So if you look now at the true positive rate, this is the power of the method for the same predictor T red, the power is also very bad. So that can't be a good thing. On the other hand, we look at the extreme, and it seems for some areas of the space, uh, the false uh, positive rate is a bit too high, but that means that the power can be much higher compared in contrast to T rate. Right? Of course, the power doesn't mean high power doesn't mean anything if the false uh, positive um, false positive rate is too high. Right? So we always have to make sure that the uh, false positive rate is controlled at a particular level. Another uh, characteristic one could evaluate is the greediness of the approach. And this is something that uh, the approach uh, nobody before us has, has done. Uh, typically, the evaluation of predictors uh, has been done on a level, on a binary level, yes, no. Has uh, the method been able to detect a repeat or not? What we have done is we uh, looked at the details. Did the method detect the correct unit length? Did the method detect the whole length of the region or not, less or more. And this is what the greediness uh, component uh, or measure tells us about. So how greedy is the method? Does it tend to detect uh, tandem repeat regions that are too long, or are they shorter? So the black color in these uh, graphs correspond to just about the correct level. And you can see that the top graphs here contain much more black compared to the other colors. So the other colors are the green is uh, too uh, greedy, the repeat region is too long, and purple is uh, too short. Okay? So it seems the best results you tend to get for uh, this row. This row corresponds to about 40 pam, which is essentially the measure of divergence. So the most similar repeats, actually the easier it is to detect them. And as you go down to 120 pam and then introduce also gaps or windows, then it becomes more difficult. Okay, so this is something we expect and we should, uh, uh, and now we, we have the understanding how this happens. The next thing is, okay, now we know about the situation, what do we do? What can we do? Because the discrepancy can be so high that we essentially end up with a prediction like this. So this is the example of predictions from these different uh, methods. Uh, on the sequence uh, BCAR, so the breast cancer resistant gene. This is the gene. And the colors essentially here uh, correspond to predicted units. So you can see it, uh, the, the discrepancies are crazy. So what do we do? Some of them must be false positive. Some of might might be simply um, too short regions that should be uh, essentially extended further. How do we evaluate it? So we uh, came up with a uh, model-based test that allows to test. Uh, whether uh, the potential repeat unions that we can align could have come from a common ancestor. And this is our definition. So essentially, the repeat units uh, might have arisen from the common ancestor. So each column uh, has an ancestor here. This is something that we can model by a tree structure how simplistic it is, and uh, contrast by, uh, the two hypotheses. The null hypothesis suggests that actually these uh, units could have just uh, be there independently by random chance, and they're not connected by any ancestry. So the time to the common ancestor in this case is infinite. 
in contrast to the alternative hypothesis where the time is finite. So if we can reject the null, we can essentially suggest, uh, say that the tandem repeat candidate is a significant one and we believe it's a true repeat. If we cannot reject the null, then we do not have any evidence to back it up. And uh, after testing this type of method, so it's all in this publication, we can show that essentially by using this test, we can get rid of the false positives and incorporate this method into a variation of different pipelines that uh, seek to annotate tandem repeat. So it can be done in many different ways. And we have developed a library that includes all the scripts that allow you to do that. This library is called um, Trial. It's a Python library. It's been published just recently in Bioinformatics. And uh, well, one of the most, most obvious uh, uh, algorithms could be uh, essentially taking genome uh, sequence, then deciding how to annotate re uh, repeat. If you have some kind of ideas of what the tandem repeats you might be interested in, so for example, you are interested in reducing rich repeats, then you have a model in, in mind uh, which can be represented as a hidden Markov model. This model then can be used to search for repeats using one of the tools that exist. Alternatively, you can say, well, I don't know uh, what that unit might be. I just, in, I'm interested in any kind of repeats. So you search de novo using an ensemble of tools that are available. By using different tools, what you ensure is that you uh, use the advantages of different methods. Okay, so you're not missing out on any of the space uh, you do as, as well as possible. However, of course, this approach means that you might also generate many false positives. So there, you have to be careful and make sure that there is a filtering uh, step. So we have the uh, filtering step here, uh, including the test for significance of the uh, tandem repeats that I just uh, explained to you in the previous slide. So essentially, um, the output of such an algorithm would be tandem repeat annotations. And if you are if you are interested in annotating tandem repeats in a homologous sense of genes, for example, and being consistent about the models of tandem repeat units that you use, you could uh, also include a refinement step where after annotating tandem repeats, you build uh, again a multiple sequence alignment of tandem repeat units and build a, a new refined uh, hidden Markov model then use this hidden mark model here again to uh, go through the steps that we've just mentioned. Of course, this hidden mark model they simply can come that describe the profile <coughs> of the unit. They simply can come from the public database such as PFARM is very famous. So it comes of, uh, for each entry, for each protein family, uh, it has a, a hidden mark model described. Uh, PFARM also is good because it's a uh, includes a lot of domains, protein domains, that actually occur in tandem. And uh, for our subsequent analysis, we actually use PFAM quite a lot. I will show you in a minute. So, Python library is available on this website here. Trial. Now, so if you apply this method meta pipeline for uh, tandem repeat annotation to human protein, proteome, you will see a picture like this. So this is in contrast to what we've seen uh, just before, the different pictures uh, corresponding to uh, different predictors. So now we're kind of unifying these predictions and getting rid of false positives as much as possible, to our best knowledge. And clearly the space is much more full now we can see that both this area and the tail are filled in much better. And we see some clear, uh, uh, very common tandem repeats, like for example, the zinc finger is very common. Uh, this spike, if you wondered what it was on the previous slide, this is the zinc finger. And of course, in PFAM, it occurs in two different entries. Uh, one of the PFAM entries is a double 
uh, unit zinc finger, which is that other spike here. That's interesting. Uh, we also see uh, the abundant leucine rich uh, regions here. Um, WD, uh, 40 repeats are very common. Um, they occur essentially in combination with main, other domains and um, serve as a rigid scaffold in, and for many, many di different types of functions, very important functions. Um, the other thing you, uh, you might want to say here is um, like why, why do we actually have this spike? What does this spike represent? Well, if you look at this, uh, the y-axis is the number of tandem repeat units, which means that the zinc finger units occur in many uh, different numbers of different product, uh, proteins. They might be combined with different protein domains and occur in different uh, numbers. So how, how does this diversity actually play any kind of functional role? So how is it conserved? In nature, this was our next question. We were really interested in evolution. Um, you can also s look at the picture more generally, not only in human pro proteome, but also across the kingdom. So, for example, this is a Swiss broad uh, distribution for bacteria. Um, the color is a bit different here compared to the previous graph, but again, the red represents the high densities, blue represents low <laughs> densities. And we see fewer repeats, of course, of bacteria, but nevertheless, quite a lot of them, many uh, very famous domains here, and all the outliers are very interesting cases. So these kind of large-scale studies, they, they bring out the list of really interesting, peculiar examples that each uh, uh, deserve further consideration. Overall, if you look uh, across the three uh, domains, as it is seen in Swiss broad currently. Um, this is the distribution which we observe. So red color essentially means that we don't find any tandem repeats in protein. Uh, in eukaryota, essentially, we, we uh, have about just under half of proteins contain tandem repeats. And some of the proteins contain two or three or more uh, different types of repeat unions. So we can see the yellow color corresponds to two different types uh, of tandem repeat. Green to three and uh, blue to four or more. Whereas in bacteria and archaea, we actually see fewer repeats in general, fewer uh, smaller fraction of proteins with tandem repeats and uh, smaller proportionally uh, the amount of two or three different tandem repeat units in the protein. Now, of course, um, what do all these tandem repeats do? How did they uh, get fixed, or are they fixed, or are they variable? So that was our next question. Because uh, essentially, in uh, non-protein DNA, these repeats are very variable, and uh, prone to slippage events. Uh, essentially, we uh, observe a lot of variation. Do we observe the same picture in the proteins, or what happens? So we decided to look at the protein tunnel repeats and the variation in those um, units, and um, conservation of units and conservation of order of units, um, by essentially defining different evolutionary modes. Uh, the evolutionary mode can be defined by um, what's interesting, by looking at the by um, species tandem repeat unit phylogeny. What does it mean? So this is kind of little concept that we invented. Uh, if you look at two proteins from species A and B that are autologous, they each contain the tandem repeat region. Okay? And you might observe a picture like this. So there the has been, it seems, some kind of conservation of the tandem repeat units. The order remained the same and uh, in both species, right? So essentially what it means that if we color uh, the phylogeny that uh, could explain the relationship between these uh, tandem repeat units with two colors, pink and uh, blue, then you would see uh, bicolored cherries 
as a result, yeah, so this is called a cherry, yeah, okay. Essentially, uh, since the speciation of these two species, we've seen strict conservation. Okay, we describe this mode of evolution as conserved. If you calculate, if you compute the probability of observing something like this, you can uh, do it exactly, you will see the probability of observing this is very, very low. So, for example, if we only have uh, four units, like in this picture, then the probability is 2.9 by 10 to the minus of 4. But that's low probability. Very low probability of seeing it by chance. If you increase the number of units, the probability drops down already to 7.4, 10 to the uh, minus 6, and even lower and lower the more, you, uh, the more units you add. Um, you also can distinguish a less strict mode of evolution. So uh, when you have some deviations from this conserved scenarios, but overall it looks conserved, you can uh, say, okay, we also accept this type of conservation. Or you can define different thresholds. But let's conservate just like ideal play, uh, cases and see how, how many of such ideal cases we've seen. On a, um, in contrast, you can also define the separated mode of evolution, which uh, looks like this, where essentially, since the speciation event, um, the repeats, tandem repeats in each species have been evolving independently. And because of that, what we see on a bi-species TI uh, tandem repeat unit <coughs> phylogeny is the clustering of the colors in two different uh, monophyletic clades. So, again, we can compute the probability of observing this by chance. So we derive the formula. And again, the values, these values are slightly higher than for the previous configuration, but nevertheless, they are still very low. So something like this, this kind of scenario, uh, could um, essentially uh, correspond to a scenario that uh, has happened due to some adaptation. And then the verification occurred in each clade. Now, once we define this kind of modes of, uh, of um, unit evolution, we can apply uh, this methodology on, uh, let's say, ensemble genomes or proteomes. We've taken all the 61 eukaryotic species available at the time, and uh, for each uh, autologous set of uh, proteins, uh, evaluated how many conserved and separated scenarios we observed for tandem repeat units. So, what we obtain is this. So, let's uh, it's kind of quite a loaded uh, graph. So, we ignore some lines for, for, the, for this moment. Let's just concentrate first on this blue line. This blue line, the thick blue line, corresponds to the conserved uh, mode of evolution, perfectly conserved, that mode of evolution that I showed you on the slide here. It's exactly that picture that we see. Okay, perfectly conserved, no mistakes. The other dotted line uh, have a, a more relaxed restriction level. So the, some mistakes are allowed. Uh, red color, however, corresponds to the perfectly separated repeats. Now, what is the uh, x-axis? The uh, x-axis is uh, essentially the different species that we had now set, uh, starting with human, going adding to uh, several hominids, uh, monkeys, here the primates, 10 primates we had, and so on. So going away in time down to all the eukaryotes here, we got east. Okay. But essentially what we are evaluating here, remember we are looking at bi-species uh, phylogenies. That means we are comparing always two sequences, two autologous sequences. And the reference sequence in this comparison is a human one. So we look at all the 
pairs of sequences of uh, proteins that are homologous to a human protein. And we are looking at uh, patterns of conservation of tandem reactions. <coughs> so what we see essentially, uh, for example, if you look at the mammals here, okay, we can see about 61% corresponds to about 61% of, of uh, tandem repeat units are conserved among all the autologous uh, proteins that we find between each mammal and human. And that is uh, quite a long divergence time, since 300 million years ago, split, split corresponding to the split of mammals. So there's a, a huge numbers of conserved tandem repeat arrangements, not only the number of units, but also the order of the unit is conserved, which seems to point to some kind of functional significance. It seems to be some kind of optimized by evolution arrangement that uh, is kept for the protein to be uh, kept functional. Even if you go as uh, far away as uh, down here to the human and east, we see uh, overall we found 52 uh, autologous proteins which is 13% of all the autologous proteins that we found between human and yeast, are conserved since the split of the human and yeast, which is 1 billion years. So, um, some serious functional uh, constraints seem to be operating on tandem repeat units and conserving configurations, some kind of uh, interesting useful uh, optimal configurations of tandem repeat unions. On the other hand, you can see that actually the amount of separated the repeats <coughs> is very, very low. Here, between the human and the primates, we, we see no such a case. So this is zero here. No separate, uh, separated scenario. However, uh, if you look at other cases, and we've looked at plants and so on, you do find such cases, and if you go further in time also, you find such cases of separation, which actually uh, point to certain adaptation events. And although they are rare, they are very interesting to be considered further. So what, what, how is this configuration uh, serving the oh, change in the function of protein to adapt for uh, presumably either new environment or new interaction partners. Uh, therefore, we had a look at the functions. We were just interested in what is the diversity of functions of proteins that contain tandem repeats of different types. And again, lots of different colors here. Uh, let's look at, first of all, what it means. We have two parts to this figure. First part, the largest one, represents, of course, the diversity of tandem repeat units that are uh, conserved, strongly conserved. So this is the scenario. You see this quite species uh, phylogeny with uh, cherries with two colors. Okay. And uh, the lower part of the graph corresponds to the diversity of the strongly separated tandem repeats. So you see the cherries are actually of one color and not two. For the strongly separated tandem repeats, it seems that there is some predomination of uh, this green color, and not as many functional categories appearing on this list. Of course, there are fewer proteins as well, uh, but this green color corresponds to the zinc finger. And then you can also see some other uh, examples of uh, tandem repeat units that are typically seen in uh, either proteins related to immunity or resistance. So that's, that's kind of a very interesting observation as it's consistent with our interpretation that the separated uh, patterns of evolution uh, seem to be pointing to some kind of adaptive events and therefore could be interesting to explore. Uh, for conserved morph of evolution, of course, we, we see a huge variety of uh, functions for both, uh, for all the three different types of uh, core classification, molecular process, uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, many more colors, so many more different types of uh, uh, tandem repeats. You can see the Lucin Rich repeats here, the blue one, light blue, WD40, very famous one, 
anchoring, this light green zinc finger, also found in conservative uh, mold. So, uh, interestingly, we see uh, the WD40, for example, is always very strictly conserved, and so is the uh, leucine Ritchie piece. So that's for your carrot, of the picture for your carrot. We don't see any separated repeats of the blue colors, or light or dark, in this picture. Right? But if we look at plants, the situation is slightly different. Uh, for the Sinrich repeats, for example. So overall, uh, we, we've done the same kind of analysis for plants, except we decided that it's not fair to have one record genome. So, for example, for eukaryotes, we have a human uh, sequence as a reference genome. Here, well, what do you think? Arabidopsis, maybe? Uh, but then we said, OK, let's be fair to all the plants. And so what we've done is we've done a pairwise comparison all to all. And by doing this, you essentially have uh, maybe fewer proteins overall, overall you analyze, but you can trace the evolutionary patterns down to each node on the whole file origin, not only in the pairwise fashion, which kind of is more informative. So what we plotted now on this uh, graph, these are also ensemble plants, all the plants available at that time. And the uh, red color here uh, corresponds to the amount of the strongly separated repeats uh, of the, uh, all of them, of all of the ones that are <coughs> found autologous in the clay, for example, for this node, right? So here we're looking at all the pairwise comparison in this clay, right? Uh, and the blue color corresponds to the conserved mode of evolution. Uh, Yellow color, now we've got two colors, gray and yellow-gray, no significance, cannot contribute any pattern. Whereas uh, yellow means that sometimes we see it uh, separated, sometimes it's kind of mixed, can be both. And what's interesting is that if we go further again here, 150 years, uh, million years ago, we see a lot of separated repeats, so majority of them are separated. But still, we see quite an interesting fraction here. Oh, sorry, uh, conserved, right? And uh, uh, still quite a significant fraction is separated repeats. Even if we go down uh, to more similar species, so here, here, for example, we see rice varieties and um, wheat, right? Here, you see uh, some proteins have a separated pattern already on that level, which is very close similarity. And these proteins are interesting to look at uh, because they could be responsible for certain uh, adaptations to environment or to a new emergent pathogen or something like that. So uh, now, of course, the leucine rich repeats are very <coughs> interesting then, but what's the role of them in, in this distribution? Because we've seen rich repeats in plants actually uh, found abundantly in resistant genes, in R genes. And uh, each plant species has maybe over 200, 250 different resistant genes, majority of them contain resistant rich repeats. So it's sort of an adaptive uh, immune system uh, that plants are using. Indeed, if you look at the goal functions, uh, you will find a lot of resistant rich repeats. Some of them are conserved, this blue color again, and some of them, or a lot of them, are actually separated. Uh, the PPIs are also uh, related to uh, resistant functions, can be related to the resistant functions. Uh, but here we see them mostly conserved. Now, how about we look at the same graph, but just looking at leucine rich, uh, leucine, um, rich repeats. If you replot it, that's what happens. So this is only leucine rich repeats. One thing that's striking, you see much more red color. Okay, so there are more, more adaptive events that you can spot on as you go along down into the, uh, to the tips, including the closer varieties. So here, all these genes that are involved are very interesting candidates to be investigated. We are looking, for example, uh, for adaptation to environmental pathogens. 
different related uh, agriculturally important uh, plant species. So essentially, the uh, conclusion from this exercise is that uh, we found that despite the fact that uh, tandem repeat unions are quite uh, short, the pairwise unit, uh, pairwise species, what we call it, five species phylogenies of TI units, tandem repeat unions, are very informative about the evolutionary history. And you can show that essentially they are pretty accurate representations. Uh, even if you go down as low as uh, 15 amino acids. Of course, if your repeat unit is uh, shorter than 15 amino acids, then you have to come up with a different methodology to think about something else. One of the uh, possibilities, for example, for collagen, which is interesting, could be to uh, look at the multiples of several uh, repeat units. <coughs> up to, for example, let's say, instead of looking at one collagen at a, uh, unit at a time, you could look at seven of them, bringing the units you're working with to 21. Okay, so that could be one of the possibilities to use, to apply this kind of methodology to study other type of repeat. But then, of course, those repeat units have to occur at la in relatively large numbers. Um, so we found that the observation of conservation and separation, as we defined, actually could be interested, depends, and it points towards certain uh, function conservation or changes in function. And uh, again, we can actually use this information of, of tandem repeat unit gains and losses to pinpoint the functional changes, because we can go down to, uh, to the non totem phylogeny and see what do these events correspond to, could correspond to. And with respect to, to this uh, study of uh, unit gains and losses, we also have um, developed another tool, uh, which essentially is a multiple sequence alignment tool called ProGraph MSA plus TR. Plus TR means essentially that it helps you with tandem repeats. So what it does uh, to tackle tandem repeats, it uses a graph structure. Uh, so it's graph-based alignment. Uh, so it allows to uh, penalize uh, repeat unit uh, gains and losses adequately, rather than the counting it as a big gap. Uh, also, this program essentially uses the same algorithm as phylogeny-aware gap placement in prime. So it's phylogeny-aware penalizes gaps correctly. Uh, the implementation is really fast. The student who was working on this software uh, was really good at coding, so it's super fast. Uh, it also can uh, align sequences based on codons, so you can run uh, your alignment using codon model directly. It also uses context-specific profiles to, uh, and because of this, uh, it does much better with deeper divergences. By context-specific profile, what we mean is it relies on the generated libraries of uh, context for three to five different residues occurring together. And that allows, uh, essentially, to cater for these deeper divergences. So somebody who was working in, uh, on intrinsic uh, protein disorder in Sweden wrote to us saying that they uh, finally found software that actually worked well with intrinsic disorder uh, regions and repeats, because they were actually interested in this connection. <coughs> and uh, we never thought about intrinsic disorder when we were developing this uh, program, but apparently two things somehow go together. Um, so uh, again, this uh, kind of graph structure uh, allows to avoid the rigid, uh, defining rigid union boundaries, because essentially because of slippage events, your repeat might not start necessarily at position one. It could be slide a little bit, right? So the graph structure naturally uh, allows you to account for this. So there is no problem there. So alternative splicing also is no problem with this kind of program. And essentially, uh, in the, our paper here, when we were looking at the properties, we showed that the accuracy increases compared to other aligners, but the reviewers also wanted an example. We first refused, we said it's cherry picking because 
essentially we can always find for uh, a counterexample also uh, if you look at statistics, right? But no, they still wanted a, a visual case, and so we kind of showed this visual case where our alignment uh, does well. So this is the reference alignment, this is true alignment with really complex gap structure. And if you use MAFT, for example, very popular, or MASA, you get an alignment like that, a squashed up, so it does not reconcile the gaps correctly. Like there are some overlapping ones. Whereas the uh, program MSA essentially builds exactly the same alignment. I think there is one little discrepancy here. I don't remember where it is. There is something here, yeah. But uh, overall, it, it provides here a perfect result. In addition, it's got a nice byproduct uh, because we are looking at the repeat gains and losses and recording them, essentially. What we can do is we can map the gains and losses on the tree that relates the different uh, tandem repeats units and see where many losses or gains uh, happened on the tree. And this is an example, again, for my favorite uh, tandem repeat unit, which is the Lucent Rich Repeat. And uh, it's, this one is uh, coming from bacterial protein, which is essentially a T3 uh, effector, which attacks plant Im uh, immune system. And uh, essentially, these uh, tandem repeat units seem to serve as uh, some kind of binding uh, uh, part of the effect that comes uh, either in direct contact with the uh, proteins in the that are being attacked in the, in the uh, plant host or via some intermediate proteins. So, um, Yes, the protein is called GALA protein. So overall, uh, some useful algorithms we hope uh, can be also used for other studies uh, where you find uh, tandem repeats. And uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators. So Elke Schaffer was my PhD student. She's done a lot and a lot of work on repeats and still can have enough of it, so we still are collaborating quite a lot. Olivia Gasquier also was uh, uh, working with us on de defining the conservation and separation modes. Adam was the one, uh, the computer science geek, who wanted to make program really fast, really fast. And um, Andre Kaya was my collaborator in Montpellier, who is a structural biologist, and with whom we started, uh, who, whose fault it is that I'm actually working on tandem repeats. He made me interested in tandem repeats. And uh, finally, Julia was a master student, and Stefan, uh, a PhD student I co-supervised, both contributed to the trial library together with Aokia. So um, now, of course, uh, the floor is open for questions.